A very warm welcome to a new episode of Melt. I'm Ritvika Gupta shooting from my home. Yes, we are still working from home. Now the lockdown has disrupted several businesses including makers and distributors of fast moving consumer goods. With restrictions on manufacturing and movement of goods, how is a company like Marico known for its popular brands like Parachute Oil and Safola Oats navigating through the crisis? We find out today from Shogato Gupta, managing director and CEO at Marico. Anand Rangaswamy, editor of Melt joins me today. Anand, Marico has really gotten its act together now after a brief struggle. How do you think the company has managed to achieve this? Uh, Ritvika, it's not a surprise because Marico is already on the path to digital transformation. So a lot of their processes and workflow was already digitized. Uh, what the lockdown did was to force them to hurry up the pace. Most of their early problems were in the analog part of the business. As in, you know, how do they get their factories to open? A uh, shortage of people to work. Uh, getting PPEs into place and so on and so forth. So these were the challenges that uh, they had to navigate. That took time. But once that took time, they have uh, a priority which is fairly clear. There's their discretionary basket and non-discretionary basket of products. They focused on the non-discretionary and increased production and ramped up distribution of those products. So I think it's a a lovely uh, sort of example of what to do and uh, as Shogata puts it, you have to transform yourself. Well, thanks Anand. Let's have a look at the conversation. The interview today has been recorded on Zoom. Apologies for the patchy stream. Let's get ready to melt with Shogato Gupta. Shogato, hello. Hi. And good to talk to you in a very, very difficult time. So uh, to begin with, tell me, what is it like for Mariko? 65 days into the lockdown, from a point of uh, what is active, what is not active, uh, what is moving and what is not moving? So I think uh, more or less uh, our factories are operating at 60 to 70 percent of the capacity, obviously with much less manpower, simply because of the fact that uh, we are working with uh, strict protocols, uh, including, you know, in terms of hygiene, strict protocols with respect to social distancing. Uh, capacity in terms of distribution, again, in some of the hotspots and red zones is still not up to the mark, but we are trying our best. Uh, also, some of our distribution partners or some of our customers are also not operating at 100%. So I think uh, it is going to take some time. Uh, we are much better off than what we were perhaps in April. And uh, we are now clocking also somewhere between 80 to 90% of our sales of our annual run rate. Having right. said that, again, uh, the core part of the portfolio is doing better. Uh, the discretionary part is not doing that well because obviously people are not willing to look at, you know, a today consumption of discretionary stuff. So it's been, uh, it's, I think the team has doing a fantastic job given the current circumstances. Having said that, I think it will take, uh, I mean, it will be far from normal in some ways, the way it's operating. Right. I wanted to talk to you about two areas in particular. One is Safola, because uh, you know, that's uh, in many ways uh, uh, an essential product you know, for a lot of people. And the other was uh, Parachute, from a context of your export market also. So first with Safola, we can talk about Safola. I think as far as Safola is concerned, uh, obviously, yes, you are right, that a significant portion of our, uh, you know, the in-home consumption or in-home cooking occasions have uh, increased drastically. Our uh, job is to make the product available. As you know, that obviously we had struggled whether in terms of production in the early days, but now we have stabilized a bit. A significant portion of Safola is consumed also through bought through modern trade. So our job is to make it available through multiple routes. It's available through a lot of retail food aggregators. We have now a direct to home. Uh, it's available through e-com and obviously available through neighborhood shops. There is an app which tells you which neighborhood shop your Safola is available in. And therefore, right. this is one brand which uh, has been doing well in the last few quarters, even before COVID, and we have continued to track pretty well. Right. And uh, when it comes to parachute, where, you know, one of the amazing things is parachute is uh, exported and well-received in places like the Middle East. Now, obviously, that... Ability to ship to the Middle East is a problem. So, uh, is that uh, some is that a problem you're able to solve, or 
you know, grappling with or how do you describe it? I think slowly, uh, see, some of the uh, parachute is uh, produced locally, especially in Bangladesh and other places. As far as Middle East is concerned, uh, also some is locally produced, some is exported. Right. Uh, obviously, there was uh, the huge, uh, there was some kind of a, uh, you know, closures towards the March, end of March and first two couple of weeks of April. But things is slowly, uh, you know, in terms of things are improving. Uh, and I think uh, we should be in a stable state another uh, couple of weeks because of the simple fact that uh, it is opening up. Some of the other markets are also opening up. In some of the international markets, for example, we have a wide range of situations. A place like Vietnam today, uh, the, as they have managed the COVID pretty well. The number of deaths has been negligible. Uh, there has been the number of new incidents are almost zero and they have opened up. Right. To, uh, compared to that, some markets are still in reasonably amounts of lockdown like a South Africa. So I think there is a wide range of lockdowns versus this one. But in most of the markets today, I think we are uh, working, uh, I would say, at around 60-70%, 70 to 80% capacities in most of the markets. Right. And, uh, you know... Uh... One of the questions I ask all uh, marketer CEOs, and I put you into that box, where you know you're a CEO, but your root is marketing. Your your background is in marketing. Is how do you handle marketing in a time like this? You know, like you said, uh, different markets have different uh, situations where some where distribution is complete, some where retail is allowed, some where the product is not available. So, what is the matrix you're dealing with on the marketing? So first, let me clarify. I think now that everything is available, I don't think right. we have a situation where in any of our markets there is intensive lockdown. Even in, uh, I think, other than the last week of March and the first one or two weeks of April, I think our availability situation has been reasonably okay. Obviously, uh, some of the hot spots, obviously, the situation is slightly still tough. I would say, I think, two, three things. Uh, people are looking for trusted brands. People are looking for leadership brands. And in this kind of a situation, I believe stronger brands and stronger organizations, uh, especially with resilience and stronger distribution, they get stronger and the weak gets weaker. And there's right. a huge opportunity for, as you know, that in 90% plus of our 90% of our portfolio, we are number one. 95% of the portfolio, we are number one or number two. And therefore, right. uh, it is. this is our, even if the category doesn't grow at the level it is supposed to grow. And you may be aware that there was a slowdown that was happening in consumption even before COVID hit. Absolutely. Uh, so therefore, seen. I think the issue is that what we have to do is to drive, uh, I would say, you know, market share gain and make up even if the category growths are not there. And the second thing is, as a marketer, I think people are not only looking for trusted brands that they can trust. Uh, they can. They are also looking for in these times, can we pass on value to the consumer? Right. Because uh, I think uh, value is very, very important. A significant portion of our consumers in the middle income group or the bottom of pyramid will have issues of disposable income and you know, over the next couple of uh, quarters. And it is very, very critical we pass on that value to the consumer. You know, uh, you're almost talking like Rajiv Bajaj who says, you have to sell your way out of this crisis. There's no other way of doing it. You know, all the stimulus, stimulus, all that won't happen if there's no consumption. So uh, how do you react to that statement of his? Well, I think the issue is very simple. Uh, obviously, there are different, uh, different sectors that are going to be impacted differently. As far as the, uh, you know, our sector is concerned, the staples part or the in-home consumption part is unlikely to get that significantly impacted. Having said that, I think we have to, uh, there will be two things. One is that, People will look at stronger brands they can trust, but they, if they don't get value, they'll be prepared to downtrade. Right. So I think it's very, very critical for leader brands to make it, uh, make the value proposition clear. So we are running a significantly aggressive cost management camp, you know, exercise across the organization so that we can channelize towards two, three things. One, providing value to the consumer. Second, how can I protect jobs? and protect salaries to the extent possible. And therefore, all other costs, I mean, we are going from a zero base to say that anything which was may have been critical in a nicer time, it's maybe nice to do now. 
and therefore yeah. how do we convert that into a uh, that kind of a savings into passing on to consumers the second thing which is very critical is availability if you are available your chances because at the end of the day i think uh, uh, there will be significant changes in the go to market whether it's the general trade whether it's wholesale because the consumer shopping behavior is also drastically going to change right before i come to the next question let me ask you about your e-commerce you know you've done your relationship with swiggy and so on and so forth is it big enough for you to focus on and spend energy on the whole so, e-commerce bit no no firstly i think as as far as regular e-commerce is concerned we it's a 5% of our sales so it's Right. Compared to a lot of companies, we are, I think, over-indexed. We be, we had invested in e-commerce much more earlier than are some a lot of players. Uh, we also had a complete digital transformation exercise going on in this organization. We believe that this is here to stay. What is going to happen in a post-COVID situation? And I believe that what uh, e-commerce could have contributed, the change that would have happened in the next two years would happen in the next six months. Right. Obviously, the composition of e-commerce is going to change now. as far as swiggies of the world is concerned i think they are we are using them to make the product available as a last mile aggregator as an alternate form now we are doing lot of experiments whether we are using technology or using a lot of third party this one to make the product available some of them will work some of them might not work but some of them which will work will will be scaling up as things stabilize right you know uh, go back to uh, a part of your answer two questions ago where you said uh, you are going through uh, an exhaustive cost rationalization exercise uh, how does uh, advertising and marketing uh, figure in that uh, in that cost uh, rationalization exercise so i think two things obviously uh, uh, we did start cutting down when april we were not sure we have started advertising having said that i think i believe that the two things the overall clutter levels in media will go down because i'm sure the other sectors relatively are not likely to uh, advertise that much so i believe that we will be still comfortable without diluting any impact or a share of voice by cutting down overall anp by 100 to 150 basis point you know i really don't discuss numbers i like to discuss the principles of your challenge so let me come to uh, the principles so how do you spend your day now because you're sitting you're you're a hands on ceo like not many ceos are you are one so how do you spend your day typically when you're locked up in your house so i think first thing what we have done is obviously uh, we start almost every day now we have made it every alternate day me and my team we have a one hour session which starts off at 8:15 in the morning right. and then each of them the cxo team have their sessions we are also doing constant communication so we are having a town we have town hall meetings every month i am having a communication with individual teams also uh, some critical teams especially in the sales and supply chain uh, meeting teams uh, individually in groups of 10 or 12 and also as i said i doing town hall so communication is a very big thing it is important to uh, also be transparent whether with respect to the fact that uh, philosophy of remuneration we couldn't do a remuneration revision exercise we have pushed it whether with respect to ensuring that we support the people who are fighting in the field uh, in terms of including our associates and thirdly i think what we have done is ensuring collaboration everybody is working remote there's the chances of making mistakes but if i think uh, today if people are understanding and having empathy i think uh, people are you know looking at each other's back and supporting each other i think that spirit of collaboration and fight has been very great and if you look at a history and a culture of an organization i think we have been successful by punching above our weight so we call ourselves insurgent than incumbent and i think what has happened this covid like situation has brought the best in us uh, i am very proud of what my team has achieved and in fact as i said that we are you know tracking 90% 80 to 90% of our average run rate of last year already in may i mean and even in last week of april and therefore i think as a and we have come out with whether it's in sanitizer we have come out with a product called veggie wash we are coming up with some more in the next couple of weeks so i think uh, i'm very proud of this team and the fact that the kind of grit uh, courage and the risk taking they have shown is exemplary okay 
Now, uh, last couple of questions. One is, uh, you know, in February, uh, digital transformation was just a, one of those irritating buzzwords which everybody was talking about. Uh, suddenly, by May, everybody is almost practicing transformation. Uh, how much do you think that the current crisis has accelerated uh, the absorption of digital transformation by uh, Mariko? So, uh, or is it that you were on course anyway? But uh, I would say that we were on course anyway. Right. So we had uh, invested in a. So as I said, that uh, we had a digital transformation cell working directly with me in the last uh, one and a half years. We started our digital transformation journey under the five buckets, which is basically in terms of listen, engage, the cell, uh, automation, and workflow, and also in the significant. Uh, we were doing investments, for example. We did this investment in this company called Biodo, which uh, we have a 55% stake. And now, uh, since this year, we would be in our, we are in the process of going to integrate this company. Although it will be uh, in a, into the Marico fold. Having said that, it will be we will keep it as a separate company because we believe that we want to maintain that uh, kind of a culture of that. So I think the process had begun. I think what will now become far more uh, got accelerated. I was ourselves. I myself, I was very surprised by the very smooth adoption of work from home. Right. So that is one area which will give us flexibility, which will lead to far more uh, having interesting people on the roles, uh, driving diversity because you don't need people who are going to work, you know, full time coming to work. So that is a big area. It will, of course, give a lot more space to people because at the end of the day, in a city like Mumbai or Bangalore or any of these cities, metro cities, you spend a lot of time traveling. So we would not maybe move to 100% work from office. Uh, the third, second thing I think is a complete uh, use of analytics for uh, weather control. See, for example, we have no clue uh, uh, in terms of physical verification of a lot of things. But I think we have used analytics, we have used all other means to have a lot more uh, you know, compliance and control systems. Uh, and lastly, I think this entire consumer engagement uh, spend on digital that will, and of course, having digital brands. Right. I think uh, also, I think one got one definite thing that got accelerated is the our direct to consumer model, which is the brand.com for Sapola. Right. Because we were yeah. actually, we were, we, that pushed us to make this. So I think uh, a lot of acceleration has happened. Having said that, fortunately for us, since the journey was already starting, I think we were uh, we handled it pretty smoothly. The one thing I was very very surprised is the seamless way in which this entire work from home and the Microsoft Teams uh, is working. Although I must say that uh, compared to a physical, this one see culturally Asian culture physical uh, you know meetings are important. You can't still do the most critical meetings, whether it's important career discussions and other things, you are much more comfortable doing it face to face. But I think the adoption has been pretty smooth. Fantastic. And uh, that's all that I want to discuss with you. So the next time I'll come across to BKC and we can have a physical meeting at your place in happier times. All the best and uh, uh, look forward to meeting all your numbers and all your challenges and keeping your workforce happy and content. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you. And that was Shagato Gupta telling us how Mariko is braving the current crisis. Here are some of the points he mentioned. Mariko believes that during these testing times, people are looking for brands that can be trusted. Products must deliver immense value to customers. Over the past couple of months, Mariko has also focused on digital transformation to boost consumer engagement. The company has partnered with e-commerce platforms to ensure products are delivered. As a company, Marico has also ensured all teams have constant communication and there is full transparency with stakeholders. On that note, let's take a look at what we have in store for this week's Creative Picks. I never thought there will be a day when Nike will say don't do it. Taking a firm stand against racism, Nike released a new don't do it ad reversing its famous tagline just do it. The brand posted a video expressing solidarity with thousands of Americans protesting against George Floyd's tragic death. The minute-long ad is a series of simple yet powerful statements set on a black background. 
Floyd's death has not only fueled a fresh wave of protests in US but also angered millions across the world. This is also not the first time Nike has spoken up against racism. In September 2018, Nike made headlines when it released an ad campaign featuring US footballer and activist Colin Kaepernick. The ad prompted both criticism and praise. Likewise, for this one, reviews are mixed. Competitor brand Adidas stood in support with Nike and retweeted the video with a message stating, Together is how we move forward, together is how we make a change. We rarely see this kind of solidarity. Adidas owned brand Reebok also provided its own statement with an Instagram post that stated, Without the black community, Reebok would not exist. We are not asking you to buy our shoes, we are asking you to walk in someone else's. At a time when a majority of brands remain silent, I think it is incredibly brave of Nike to take such a strong stand. The ad carries an extremely powerful and relevant message. Take a look. And here are a few other brands that have shown support for the Black Lives Matter movement. Google altered its logo and added a message saying, we stand in support of racial equality and all those who search for it. Twitter changed its profile image to a black and white version of its logo, adding Black Lives Matter to its description. HBO changed its Twitter name to Black Lives Matter. Netflix put up a post saying to be silent is to be complicit. Ben & Jerry's showed its support in a lengthy statement highlighting racial injustice as the defining civil rights and social justice issues of our time. Amazon announced that it is standing in solidarity with the black community. Disney also posted a message supporting fellow black employees, storytellers, creators and the entire black community during this time of unrest. With that, it's a wrap on this episode of Melt. To follow us on social media, our handle is ready to melt. You can also stay informed on what's happening in the world of advertising and marketing with our daily Melt update on our website readytomelt.com. And I'll see you next week, same time, same place. Goodbye.